gentlemen, good evening. It's uh, 6 15. I know we're 15 minutes behind schedule, but it's it's not the best of weather in Luxembourg tonight, so I imagine it takes a little while to get yourselves here. But thank you um, to everybody that's joined us tonight. We have a exciting evening tonight to learn about uh, a very um, difficult situation, but a lot of opportunities uh, that perhaps seem unimaginable now before we begin. But by the end of the evening, I think you're going to have a new outlook on the problem set and, uh, and the potential solutions. Uh, now, we're very fortunate uh, for many reasons, but uh, one, one, uh, one little saved issue here is that Raymond, who is the chairman of the Investing for Development, who is behind this conference, they uh, they wanted to, to make you guys feel the issue that we were going to deal with, so we had to stop him for turning the the temperature up to 45 degrees. So I think you can already um, be very, very happy about that. And we do have water, which I don't think is going to be the case for long, right, Ravi? Uh, so um, just to get you in the in the mood and to be more ironic, I'm going to talk to you about a, a snowball. Uh, and why am I bringing up a snowball? Well, this event, the reason we're here tonight together is uh, two people. Uh, two game changers that met and discussed an issue that was important to them both. And through the inspiration from that conversation, they got their respective organizations involved. Um, and you are all here tonight to what to expect. Well, you probably will be a little bit uncomfortable. There's going to be facts and information that I think is going to make us a bit uneasy, but I think that is, that is the nature of the discussion. Uh, but we're also going to discuss solutions and empowerment and what we can do here in Luxembourg uh, as a country, as a nation, uh, as investors, as individuals. So I don't really know what to expect from tonight, but I'm so excited to present a remarkable crew of speakers and panelists that will be able to give us many different perspectives on this issue. Um, I know some of you here for climate change issues, some of you are for uh, migration and refugees. Others are just here to open your minds to a completely new issue. And I can guarantee you one thing, based upon the speakers we have tonight, you are going to learn something. You're going to leave here with a sense of uh, empowerment. Without further ado, I would like to invite Casper Vansdeben from Investing for Development. I think you're going first. It says on the, it, it, if that, no, it's a big lie. I've, I've already started with a lie. We did not make it 45 degrees and we also, tricked you on this one. We're going to start, of course, with a host, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Bazin from uh, BGL BNP Paribas, the country head. If you please put your hands together. Thank you very much, Ada. Uh, yes, my name, is, my first name is Jeffrey, but it's okay. And, uh, and happy to host you. Uh, we are extremely delighted, yes, to, and very honored to to host you today for this uh, outstanding conference about climate change and uh, impacts on uh, migration. Uh, dear Raymond, uh, dear also Caspar uh, uh, from uh, LM LMDF and, uh, and dear Ravi and dear guests, uh, uh, dear colleagues also because we have some staff from the bank uh, who are quite motivated by that. Um, I would like to first uh, share some um, I have some convictions that our group has uh, about uh, globally uh, what means um, uh, climate change and what we have to do in terms of uh, being a responsible bank. So in that context, I, I would like to tell you that uh, as, as founding member of the Luxembourg Microfinance and Development Fund already nine years ago, BGL BNP Paribas over the years been a, a trustful partner of one of the very first impact investing product with the Luxembourg Touch. And our aim over the years was to put impact investing on the agenda of our business lines and our, our clients. Why our group BNP Paribas is engaged uh, today? Well, acting sustainably and having a positive social and economic impact as an international banking group, such as BNP Paribas, is essential in terms of corporate social responsibility, as well as business opportunity 
and access to new markets. Uh, according to United Nations Environment Programme uh, Finance, at least $1.5 trillion in annual climate financing is needed to meet the target of less than a two degrees rise in global warming per year. This is a challenge we want to address, but also a business opportunity to diversify our products and services. BNP Paribas has made the fight against climate change its top priority, environmental, environmental priority. Our commitment aligns with the Paris Agreement. Today, we are not only discussing the impact of migration and climate change, but also how can we find solutions to the numerous negative impact of climate change, especially migration. I just want quickly to share with you four actions points, four action points we are currently working on as a group, but also locally in Luxembourg. First action, financing the energy transition. Our group committed to bring its financing and investment activities in line with the International Energy Agency scenario and the 2015 Paris Agreement, which aims to keep global warming below two degrees by the end of this century. To meet this objective, we have taken a number of decisions. First, we have decided to cease financing high polluting activities such as coal ex extraction, whether through mining projects or by any mining companies specializing in coal that do not have a diversification strategy. Coal-based power plants, projects primarily dedicated to the transport and export of gas and shale oil or oil derived from bituminous sands, and at last, Arctic exploration projects or oil and gas production projects in the Arctic. In addition, we decided to increase our total financing for renewable energy to 15 billion by 2020 worldwide, and in Luxembourg, this will represent 200 million and to set aside 100 million for financing startups working on innovative solutions for energy transition. So a lot of money we want to put in that energy transition uh, topic. Innovation and sustainability go far for us hand in hand. And during the last year, we launched a range of sustainable finance products. For instance, we are one of the global leaders of the green bonds uh, market in 2017 5.3 billion in placement were registered and between april 2017 and april 2018 the bank was a leading co-finance in 20 green bonds operations this summer two of the first bnp Paribas uh, bonds uh, green bonds were listed on the luxembourg uh, green stock exchange one other very interesting example that i want to share today with you is the tropical landscape finance facility that we have arranged. Together with the United Nations Environmental Programme and with the Indonesian government, we set up an innovative platform for green lending. The aim is to support smallholder projects related to renewable energy access, agroforestry, water access, and responsible agriculture, among other sustainable activities. This is according to us, a very good example of how a bank we can contribute to improve living conditions and fight climate change at the same time. And since 2011, the BNP Varba Foundation sustains also research on climate change through its climate initiative program and has invested 6 million euros in research on climate change. To give you an example, one recent study has been on the impact of climate change on the coral reef and another on tracking climate change on tropical rainforests. Uh, our second action is about reducing our direct impacts. At BNP Paribas Worldwide, we are about 200,000 people, employees in 74, 74 countries. And in Luxembourg, in particular, we have around 4,000 employees. We are many of our direct, we have many and our direct impacts while working, traveling, and store, storing data are huge. This said, our first contribution to reduce CO2 emissions is by reducing our own and direct CO2 uh, emission, of course. 
We have an active policy of energy efficiency in our buildings and data centers. For instance, this new building where you are seated today is um, uh, got last year's three prestigious environmental certifications. They have enabled a significant reduction of around 40% of direct carbon emissions. And of 2017, we have achieved to become, as a banking group, CO2 neutral by reducing energy consumption, switching to green energy, and last but not least, engage partnership to counteract CO2 emissions that cannot be reached. Uh, the third action we undertake is boosting responsible investment. We have never had so many social responsible investments as a high products on the market and such an appetite for sustainable investing. Today we see an unprecedented number of innovative sustainable products uh, developing and in need of sustainable finance in the real economy. In 2017, BNP Paribas Wealth Management reached 12 billion uh, invested in responsible, in responsible investment, which has grown by 50% every year since 2011. And in Luxembourg alone, BGL BNP Paribas offers more than one socially responsible investment funds, ranging from thematic, thematic funds, such as the Parves Fund on water, food, climate change and environment, to more general SRI funds, such as the BNP Paribas Human Development. That is already a major impact for us and, and the start of a long and inspiring route, route ahead, uh, road ahead. Sorry. And the fourth action is acting locally. Our responsibility towards our society is one uh, other pillar of CSR strategy. In terms of climate change and migration, one of the main focuses of our engagement during the last years has been our constant support to the integration of refugees in Luxembourg. Thanks to the support of the group BNP Paribas, we could implement several uh, initiatives and projects with Caritas, Croix Rouge and Microlux to support the social and economic integration of refugees in Luxembourg. More recently, one of our entrepreneurs is implementing a promising program called One Step Forward as a very concrete solution to the so-called refugee crisis in Luxembourg, thanks to training, mentoring, and, and a dedicated volunteering community. Refugees uh, get employed uh, with, within our group in Luxembourg. Last but not least, I would like to thank LMDF for bringing together different stakeholders to discuss tonight these pressing uh, issues. It is by working all together as individual citizens, governments, international organizations, and companies that we are able, we are going to be able to create the conditions to a better future. Thank you very much for attention and enjoy very much this conference. Thank you. Oops. Thank you so much. I think the rest of us can go home after, th after that presentation of those um, remarkable statistics and initiatives. Thank you. I, I'm so inspired by the bank. And now fake news is finished because Casper is on stage from Investing for Development. Thank you, Heather. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I think uh, it's been a rainy uh, November evening and you made it all here. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you as well to um, BGL BNP Paribas for immediately agreeing to co-hosting this conference with us. I think we didn't have to ask uh, very long. The, the answer was quite immediate, a yes, we would like to do this together. And I think that expresses a certain uh, trust in each other and uh, a certain partnership which now uh, has, has a history of nine years and which is very important to us. I think what we do as a very small structure, we are not uh, BGL, uh, BNP Paribas, we are not BNP Paribas, we are five people in Luxembourg, so the scale is somewhat different. Um, we can only uh, do what we do if we effectively collaborate with actors like BGL. Now, this topic is um, important to us, I think, because it, it hits on the activities we do in our different sub-funds, and we have two sub-funds. One is focused on microfinance, so it 
deals with economic empowerment. It tries to reduce social inclusion in some of the most difficult countries on this earth, including a lot of West African countries. And the other fund, the Forestry and Climate Change Fund, as the name indicates, um, is very dedicated to reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases from uh, forest degradation and deforestation and reverse that trend and using the power of forests to capture CO2 um, and, and store it over time. Uh, so it is a very effective mechanism which could help us manage this crisis. Now, refugees and migration because of climate change sort of sits between those funds and is a bit of a cross topic. If I think about recent concrete experience, I think we have the luxury that we have always our feet on the ground in a lot of different places and can observe a lot. If I think about what we've been observing recently, um, there are a couple of things which come to mind. Uh, the first one is uh, Nicaragua had a number of dry years. 2015 has been a very dry summer. 2016 has been as dry. And so what that led to was internal migration. Small farmers packing their things and moving to wetter areas in that country. Those wetter areas usually were the areas where you found forests, and this is why we know about this, because people started to settle and cut the forests uh, to engage in smallholder agriculture. So this is sort of an internal migration pattern, which seemed to me quite directly linked to a changing climate. The second phenomenon is one we've known for a long time, which is an increase in migration from rural areas to cities. And in our view, that also happens because life in rural areas is becoming often quite difficult, particularly to those who are not large producers. Um, the third feature which we are seeing, and I'm particularly thinking of West Africa here, is a regional migration, meaning people from Sahel countries moving south to the coastal countries, from Mali to Ivory Coast, from Niger to Nigeria. And this is a big flow of people. We, we, we are not quite conscious of this here, but this is a very significant flow of people. And then you have that tip of the iceberg, which is what we always see in the news. Um, I've been to Guatemala four weeks ago, and I saw this caravan of people passing through the countries on the way to the US. And um, so this very small tip of the iceberg is what we constantly uh, get served in the news. Um, now, these are sort of the phenomenon. And um, we, what we are trying to do in this conference is talk about that talk about that in a quite factual way, but as well talk about actions and what can we do to change matters. We already heard a very impressive range of actions uh, the BNP Paribas group has taken, including exiting coal, promoting more sustainable investments. I think we were going to have discussions and hearing some more. Now, the question is a little bit about urgency and timescales. And if, if, you, if you come back to the basics of this, um, the, the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, I was 12 at the time, basically set out the agenda. It said, we need to reduce greenhouse gases, we need to reduce the loss of biodiversity, and we need to do something against desertification. That was 1992. Um, we are now standing here in 2018, and the question is, have we done enough? And we all know the answer to that, unfortunately, is no. Um, but that, does that mean we need to despair and this is such a complicated problem that there's nothing we can do? Or are we at a point where there are a lot more forces coming together, a lot more actors coming together to really try to change things step by step? And I'm an optimist, I'm of that opinion. I'm of the opinion that we are at a point of time where a lot of energy and a lot of actors come together, actors from the financial center here, uh, small startup actors like us, government, and we're going to see a very impressive panel on that and really start to change the, th the way we are working, the way we are consuming, uh, the way we need to harmoni harmonize our existence on this planet with its limitations. So um, I'll stop here again by thanking the bank for the collaboration, thanking the ERB, who is here and also an important partner, thanking all the panelists and wishing you all a very interesting evening. Thank you, Casper. So, Ravi, do you remember which glass of water is yours? 
Okay, it's going to be. Is it? <laughs> it's tricky. Ladies and gentlemen, we, our keynote speech tonight, all the way from Sri Lanka, Dr. Ravi Fernando, would you please join us on stage to give us the overview? And I think the title of your presentation, I like, Building a Pro Proactive Strategy to Minimize the Impacts of Climate Migration. Will you fill us with inspiration, please? Thank you, Ravi, for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed an honor to share a few words on a subject that is very close to my heart and very close to my work. And today, what I'm going to try to do is to re-emphasize a key word that I'm going to constantly use throughout the presentation. And the, word is going, the two words are focused urgency. Focused urgency. And I hope by the end of this presentation, we see how defocused the world's leaders and the world's businesses are yet in terms of the word urgency. I think the word I want to try and emphasize today is urgency. The report that I'm going to uh, be quoting right through this presentation is the Groundswell Report. And the title of my presentation is Building a Proactive Strategy to Minimize the Impacts of Climate Migration. Building a proactive strategy. So in other words, bringing focus and doing so with urgency to minimize the impacts. And the reason I'm using the word minimize is because I believe we have now come to a stage in the world where no longer are we going to not face the massive challenges of climate change. We have now come to a stage of managing and minimizing and adapting to climate change. Because like Casper mentioned a few minutes back, 1992 was the Rio Earth Conference where 209 signatories said, we are going to keep temperatures under 1.5 degrees. 26 years later, we have increased carbon emissions by 62%, deforested 70% of the planet, and we have already gained 1.15 degrees in terms of global temperatures, and we are trying to keep it below 1.5. So the Paris Agreement was really a starting point and where everyone said, we are going to get together and do something about this. And guess what? After 194 countries signed to the Paris Agreement, we now have a situation when we add up all the commitments every single country made on making sure the planet does not cross the one and a half, the two degree centigrade issue, there's a gap of 67%. And if you want to know where I'm getting that information, please Google the UNEP gap emissions report, where it says there's a 67% gap between what we need to achieve and what we are achieving today in terms of m keeping temperatures below. I was thrilled to see, listen to uh, Jeffrey talk of the kind of in initiatives they're taking. But I hope by the end of this session, every one of you will begin to realize there's something you can do and something we can do to try to minimize the impacts of climate change. The, uh, between 2011 and 2016, I was engaged in quite a bit of research at the University of Cambridge, and I published a book in 2015, but this manuscript was actually out in 2012. And interestingly, <clears throat> at that time, I, I simply wrote that businesses must wake up to the reality of operating in a warmer, water-constrained and uninhabitable world. And this was through the research that we were doing at the time. A wa warmer, water-constrained and uninhabitable world. And my questions at that time, five years ago, was how will humanity cope up with this crisis? Number two, will we see environmental migration at an unprecedented rate? Because I began to see that this was going to be definitely a fallout as global warming began to happen. Number three, how must 
national and business leaders address this issue with urgency. And guess what? Here's the Groundswell report. And the Groundswell report says, by 2050, we are going to see 143 million climate refugees. This is the World Bank's report. This is not my report. But five years ago, I began to sense that this is the way it's going to happen. And the figures are 40 million from South Asia, 80 million from Sub-Saharan Africa, and 17 million from Latin America. And when we talk of South Asia, we can see all these th the figures coming to pass. Whenever we hear the word migrant, we think initially that these are all conflict migrants. But here's the figure. 62% of all migrants are climate migrants. And only 38% are conflict migrants. And you'll find this in this report. So there is a massive need for climate change adaptation. And what are some of the common issues in the regions where this massive migration is going to begin to happen? Some of these migrants are going to be migrating internally. Some of them relocating in urban cities, like Casper mentioned. But the majority are going to leave that country. All three regions have areas of water scarcity and large shares of population depend on agriculture. And we can comfortably say that water is going to be one of the critical factors that is going to, if not solved, if not addressed, is going to come back and hit us in a way that you and I can't imagine. We take water for granted. But believe me, today in many of the sub-Saharan countries in, in Latin America and in Africa and in South Asia, there are regions, there are 22, 25 districts even in the country I live in, 25 districts out of, out of which 22 don't have water. And this is now beginning to happen. And most of these countries depend on agriculture, especially rain-fed agriculture, in terms of ensuring they have agricultural crops. And guess what? The rain's not coming. And in India recently, I read a report which said many of the farmers are beginning to commit suicide because they're having drought and they are not able to have any produce come out. So this is a real factor, a common challenge. So here are two charts which I'm going to spend a moment on to try and bring this whole issue to light. And the presentation is going to be initially on the issue, and then we talk about some solutions. So mapping the impacts of climate change, we can see extreme weather is now beginning to hit all of us. Today, we know that a good part of Vietnam, especially North Vietnam, is underwater. We know the Californian fires are continuing. There was a time that the number of extreme weather incidents, which are three types of incidents, incidents that cause extreme temperatures, drought, and storms and thunderstorms and hurricanes, three kinds of extreme weather incidents. Before the year 2000, the average number of extreme weather incidents in the world was about 40 to 50, at most 70. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are talking of 450 to 480 incidents per annum, which means there are nearly one and a half incidents a day. So extreme weather is happening. Sea level rise is beginning to happen, and I'm going to show you a chart on that as well. Agricultural productivity loss. I've already talked about how in all three regions they depend on agriculture, depend on rain-fed agriculture and mass agriculture, and how this is already beginning to hit them. The next chart is about global water stress. If you look at this map, you will begin to see that a good part of the southern hemisphere nations, and including even some European nations, by 2030, which is 12 years from now, which is also the time frame for the Paris Agreement, will experience severe water stress and 
in terms of no water stress, there are very few regions left now. So water stress is going to be a factor which is going to basically galvanize this migration. The second point is on global warming. If you look at the 16 most, the highest, hottest years ever recorded on the planet in the last three million years, 16 of them happened after the year 2000. 16 of these years happened after the year 2000. And we are in 2018. And every year is getting hotter than the year before. So we are beginning to see unprecedented temperature rise. And this year, we had people dying in Japan of a heat wave. 65 people died of a heat wave in Japan. And another 70 people died of a heat wave in Canada. Now, why am I picking Canada and Japan from all these other countries which are having issues? Because we would have expected people living in those countries to have the opportunity to escape these heat waves. We don't, I mean, if you hear heat waves uh, wiping people out in South Asia or Africa or the Middle East, you say, okay, so that, that's ex expected. But in Japan and in Canada. And besides that, we've begun to see temperature rise getting into the 50 degree mark in so many parts of the world today. So the first key point I want to make is water scarcity is pretty much rife and global temperatures are rising at an amazing rate. Therefore, here's why there are climate migrants. Because water scarcity also means no food. Extreme temperature means which is not uninhabitable. Uninha These are an analysis of all the extreme weather incidents that have happened in the last, between 1995 and 2015, and 81% of these incidents are pretty much to do with floods and storms. And I'm sure every one of you have heard of or experienced, even in Europe, floods and storms. Most countries are experiencing this, and extreme temperatures. So today, the reality of a plus 1.15 degrees from the, uh, the, the Industrial Revolution has already happened. And the world is talking about keeping temperatures below 1.5 degrees, and we are already 1.14 degrees. So before I go into solution mode, I want to first challenge every one of us to think about if all the commitments every nation has made to keep temperatures below the 1.5 degrees is falling short by 67%. And if the world needs $1.5 trillion, as Jeffrey mentioned, per annum to solve this problem, do we, where, where are we going to get this cash? So I'm going to give you two quick examples of where we can get this cash. Do you know how much money the world spends to subsidize fossil fuels so that people are able to buy petrol, diesel cheaper? Does anyone know? Any guesses? Ladies and gentlemen, the figure is $5.3 trillion per annum. The world spends $5.3 trillion per annum subsidizing the very thing that is causing climate change. And we need to get one-fifth of that money and put it into renewables, and we are already on track. And guess what? We spend another 3 to $4 trillion in weapons. So there is enough money around the world. What is missing is focus, urgency. And when you read the IPCC report that just came out in October, what is it saying? 
It's saying that when the world crosses 1.5 degrees centigrade, the loss to the planet in GDP is going to be $57 trillion. This is not my report. This is the IPCC report just, just came out in October. And this is going to be presented in the 2020 uh, summit. And I don't know if we can wait till 2020 to start looking at this number. It's, we should be looking at it like yesterday, right? 1.5 degrees centigrade and boom, 57 trillion out of the world economy. What is the global economy? GDP is 80 trillion. 57 trillion is pretty much wiping half the, more than half that. And then they say if we cross two degrees centigrade, the world will lose $67 trillion. Trillion dollars, not billions, not millions, trillions. And the last figure on that report is if we cross 3.7 degrees centigrade, the loss will be $515 trillion. That's about five years of GDP wiped out. So I hope all of you understand the very cause of climate change is being subsidized in other words, we are really saying if we know fossil fuel burning is causing climate change, we are going to give you 5.3 trillion so you can have more fossil fuel. Isn't that strange? It's like saying, and I said this two years ago at a conference in Luxembourg, it's a bit like saying we know sugar causes diabetes and we are going to subsidize the price of sugar so you can have a little more sugar. And that is where we are at, at a global level, at a leadership level, at a national level, at a business level. So what should we do about this? Now, I'm quite familiar with the, UN global, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And one of the research areas of my work was understanding what is going to trigger businesses to embrace sustainability into their strategies. I think the best governments will be able to do is to at least have sustainability enabling policies. But business is the game changer for the planet. And if we can get business leaders looking at sustainability as a strategic investment, then we have a hope for this planet. And I yet think if businesses wake up, we are going to yet hold this whole story up. So out of these 17 goals, what we began to do was to ask the question, what are the key goals that are immediately needing action? I'm not saying the other, seven, other 13 goals are not needed, but I'm saying these four are more urgently needed than the others. The first goal I want to talk about is investment in renewable energy in terms of the new technologies in solar and battery. And you know that the Teslas and the BYDs have already begun to mobilize this new technology. And it is already installed in South Australia, installed in Hawaii, and this technology is available. So why aren't we unleashing more money? There are today one gigawatt, gigawatt electricity plants available from Tesla, right? So I think the first urgent need is to unleash funds into reducing the very thing that's causing climate change, and that is to switch into renewables. And nothing is more important on the planet today than doing that. And if in the Paris Agreement, all nations had to make a commitment to making sure that they just focus on going for renewable energy, we won't be in this crisis today if that was the only commitment that was required. Because if we cross this one and a half degree centigrade, I already told you the numbers. So number one priority is that. To me, as I look at the second priority as goal number six, which is water. Because I already showed you the water scarcity map. And there are so many things that can be done on water. And I will share two technologies that is there for us today. You know, we have to invest in desalination and precision agriculture, because I honestly believe that in the regions which are agriculture driven, who wait for rainwater, they are not going to get the water. Precision agriculture is a way to solve some of that issue. We must begin to invest in reforestation. 
you know, we've wiped out 70% of the global forest. We now deforest a football field worth of forest in the Amazon every day. And the new the leader of, the, of Brazil has basically said, we need to grow more soya beans. But guess what? The, the question is, uh, we need to feed the world's population, and therefore we need more food. But today, we waste 40% of all the food we pr produce. So we don't have a world food scarcity problem, we have a world food wastage problem, and if we address the wastage problem, we can give food to another 7 billion people. So, I believe that investing in reforestation is crucial because that enables the rainwater cycle, and we have to be putting money into that. Lastly, we, we must begin to invest in the sustainable economy, in terms of the circular economy, in terms of goal 12. So, I honestly believe that the solutions are within these four goals. You know, when somebody is drowning in the sea, you don't send them a leaflet saying there are 17 ways to save yourself. When somebody is burning in his house, you don't send him a leaflet saying there are 17 ways to solve this problem. You first stop the fire. You first stop the fire. And I'm saying we have to stop the fire. And that is the first and most important thing. Then we can think about the next thing, right? What's the point if we've got everybody out of poverty and three quarters of them lost their lives due to climate change? What's the big deal? So these are the four areas I believe that we should work on. Why am I talking about prison agriculture? Because Europe leads the world in prison agriculture. Holland, in Wageningen, is referred to as the Silicon Valley of precision agriculture. I know how many of you are from Holland. Are there any from Holland here? Fantastic. I, I have the greatest respect because do you know what? Do you know Holland is the second largest exporter of all fruits and vegetables in the world? And how do they do that with precision agriculture? Do they grow it in mass fields? No. They grow it in water mediums. Put the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, all the nutrients into the water. And their yields are four times better than most of the other countries which have mass agriculture. You know, this is one area that the, we have to be targeting and building strategy. The second one is an area very close to my heart because I've been involved in nanotechnology and setting up one of the biggest, one, one of the key institutes in Asia and I believe nanotechnology and graphene is another huge new technology for unleashing the water desalination. And today there, there is enough evidence that a graphene sheet can trap the salt molecules and release the water molecules, and this technology is now beginning to see a new opportunity. Here's a new, I'm just sharing with you two ideas. I mean, we could have spent, if we had one day, we'd have spent talking about all the ideas. But I just want to talk about renewable energy and water, because these are the two things that are going to solve, save us. Otherwise, you'll find nations going after nations for water. Today, there are three world conflict points for water. In the Nile, the Nile Delta, there's already conflict between Ethiopia and all those countries fighting for the water. In the Mekong, you can see the conflict in terms of water, in, in terms of, and then you have to look at the Ganges and, and the, the key rivers in India, the Chinese and the Indians are already beginning to fight for the water. So water is already a conflict zone. But what if we desalinate <laughs> the sea, sea, sea water? So in closing, I want to leave you with this idea. I think Luxembourg has an amazing opportunity to become the center of the planet in terms of unleashing focused urgency in terms of the finance required. But we are never going to achieve that if everybody works in silos. I think the future idea I have to share with you is to create a coalition for sustainable finance. That coalition must have is pretty much linked to one of those four areas. Water, renewable energy, 
sustainable consumption, or deforestation. And every coalition must have three partners. It must have a lead finance partner who is the champion, who is bringing the story to everybody. And he's taking the story forward and saying, we are the champions and we are going to take this issue of renewable energy. We are going to form a coalition. And that coalition must have a lead artist and a lead actor like the likes of BNP Paribas. But it must also have a tech provider because we need the technology provider to deliver the goods on the technology. It's not in us having the money. We must have the technology. And the third actor is funding partners and every one of us, even if it's one euro, can be a funding partner to this. And every one of us can be mobilized into taking one of those three, four areas and being a partner. So I would like to leave that thought with you. Create a strategic coalition for sustainable finance and make Luxembourg the shining light of investing with urgency, with focused urgency. Because if we don't do that, all that is happening around us will come back to us. Today, I think Luxembourg has about 800,000 people. 600,000 people. Some of that 143 million is going to end up here. With that thought, thank you very much for listening. Let's do something about it. Excellent. Thank you so much. You know, when I opened up, I said, I mentioned this snowball concept. That's, that's where the snowball started. You, you take Ravi and you match it up with Raymond, and then you take Investing for Development, and then you take BGL, BNP Paribas, and EIB, and slowly you find this snowball, and I hope you guys are really feeling. I, I, I walked up here because I'm going to get a signature of this. Ravi, you are, you are absolutely amazing. You're, somebody's already shaking your hand. You're amazing. Uh, thank you. Um, our next speaker, we, we, in a different dimension, we would have audience reactions, uh, but given the fact we started a little bit late, we decided to move forward in, our, uh, in the planning and make sure that we can take a break later on and have a chance to come and meet Ravi in person and discuss with him and, and all the other speakers. Um, our next speaker, because we now we've looked at uh, perspective, Ravi's been consulting people from China to the center of the universe, which is here in Luxembourg. I, I noted that down. Um, we're going to make a lot of change from here. But we have um, somebody from, from the local Luxembourg ecosystem representing a very, very large and influential player in the space, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hakan Lucius from the European Investment Bank. Would you please give us your thoughts on this issue? <laughs> you know where your water is. Thank you, Heda. If Ravi put urgency on the forefront, I will put our responsibility. That urgency is our responsibility. Let me thank the organizers and the hosts for having us here today. And let's look at this responsibility we have. When starting out on all the challenges, migration, climate change, let us remember one thing, how many people we are on this planet? Seven billion? 7.6, is that much? Is it normal? I'll give you a little chart of 7.6 billion compared to the history of mankind going back 10,000 BC. If you look at it like that, it's unprecedented. The amount and sheer number of humans which we are is unprecedented. Likewise, the quality of life we have is unprecedented. Never before did we live so long. Global average, 70 years. Never before did we have so many people, literate, boys and girls. Never before did we have so low infant mortality. These are fantastic achievements. And we are continuing to grow. We are growing with one million people, net increase every four and a half days. So next Monday will be one million more people. And this is continuing. So this increase obviously has to be sustained. We need to support these people. We need to be able to keep our quality of life and to give the same quality to the newcomers, the ones which increase. So in doing that, we use resources. And we use too many resources faster than we replenish them. 
And that's why the sustainability challenge comes. WWF will say we are using one and a half planets per year and we only have one planet. So that puts it in a nice picture, one and a half planets, more than we have. So there has to be some change in the way we go forward. Because the choices we have made to support these seven billion people and have the quality of our life are not necessarily sustainable. Just think of the energy use. We have sought and used fossil fuels as our main source of energy. We turn on the lights. Somewhere in Europe, there are some coal-fired power plants running. You take a plane. Did you ever take a plane which does not emit greenhouse gases? When a truck goes, there's always some use of greenhouse gases. Some fossil fuels are being used. This is the choice we have made. It need not have been like that, but it is. But it's now time to start changing. Because otherwise, we will not be able to sustain the quality of life and the number of people we have got. Because we have started changing the world. We have started changing the world through our activity. And nowhere else do we see that activity as beautifully as in the melting of ice. So let me take you um, to Alaska to the New Year Glacier 70 years ago, and let's do a quick time travel. 70 years in seven seconds. Beautiful, both taken in August. But this is the romantic side. If you extrapolate this, and if you think of what's happening today, and Ravi has put it so beautifully, we are, of course, having massive changes. And when we say one degrees, two degrees, three degrees, what does that mean? Maybe one degrees more could be something nice because it's getting a bit warmer. Problem is, it is not that everything shifts by one degrees. It is the distribution that changes. Now, let's have a look at that. This is the distribution of summer temperature anomalies. Zero degrees on average, and then you have some days which are colder, some days which are warmer, and that is quite normal. And this normal distribution actually was the case 50 years ago. The measurements showed that it's exactly like that. You have got warmer days, red, you have got colder days, blue. And if you now please concentrate on the maximum of the warmer days, here at three degrees, those are the days which are the warmest ones. Now we go from 50 years ago to the last decade and look at the measurements there. And the center point, the zero, will go to one. That's exactly what's happening. The center point going up by one degree, but now look at the extremes, the maximums. So the three has become quite routine. And now we get extremes of five. The problem with the climate change is not that it goes up only by one or two degrees. It is that the distribution is going up, and the extremes are getting much more extreme. And you get many, many extremes. You get extreme hot days. You get extreme winds. You get extreme rainfalls. You get extreme hurricanes. I think Norway, in the last two years, had the hottest day they ever measured, they had the strongest rainfall they ever measured, and they had the strongest wind they ever measured. This is the real challenge in the climate change as we go forward, because it's the distribution that changes. So if this is the challenge, and we know this since 1992 or even earlier, what are we doing about it? Well, we of course know this, and we know that everyone has to work together. We know that the governments, the private sector, civil society, us as citizens have to work together. And we have set goals. In the European Union, we have set ourselves goals. We have set ourselves goals on renewable energies, goals on energy efficiency, and goals on reduction of greenhouse gases. We have set them for 2020, and we are on our way to hopefully meeting them. We have set ourselves goals for 2030, and by 2050, we should be largely decarbonized. That's the pathway we would like to have. And on this pathway, when we have set all these goals to work together, what has happened or what do we do as the European Union and the Bank of the European Union? 
the bank of the European Union, the European Investment Bank, is our bank. It's a public bank. And the actions we are taking on climate action are quite clear. Since more than 10 years, climate action is mainstreamed into all decision-making. All lending that is being done, all financing that is being done, is mainstreamed into climate action. And today, we also talked about migration. So what are we doing on that side? Now, migration is a phenomenon which is not necessarily due to climate action or climate change only, but it's definitely exacerbated. And we just heard the figure of 143 million possible climate change migrants coming on top of it. 2016, we set aside 6 billion for the Economic Resilience Initiative. 6 billion to help countries in our neighborhood to the south and to the southeast in the Western Balkans and in the me Southern Mediterranean countries to become more resilient. Countries which are more resilient to deal with shocks, to deal with changes, can absorb these changes much better and they can also fight the situation much better. So their resilience is also our benefit. And I'm proud to say that now two years into the program, more than two billion have been committed for projects which are actually creating more than 100,000 jobs, providing 420,000 people sustainable transport and water for 4.6 million people, water and sanitation facilities. On top of it comes renewable energy investment and a better resilience overall, which helps them and us. But this is one part. This is what we are doing. The world is much larger. And we are still running on fossil fuels. And we have got huge amounts of reserves. You might know that to keep the two degrees budget, the two degrees target, our budget is 1,000 gigatons. And I'll plot you those 1,000 gigatons against all the known oil, gas, and coal reserves. If we were to bor burn them, how much carbon can we burn? To the right, you will see the two degrees budget. That's about 1,000 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. That's when we emit all that, that's we'll, what we will get with two degrees. And on the left-hand side, you have got what you would get if you were to burn all oil reserves, gas reserves, and coal reserves. My question to you is, who believes that we are going to stop at two degrees? Hands up. Who believes that we are going to surpass the two degrees? Thank you. So there is need for urgent action. There definitely is need for urgent action, because if we want to sustain our lives, our quality of lives altogether, it is that we are on an unsustainable track. And that is a choice of technology, and that is a choice of life which we are having. And let me show this to you in the following case. We are having a certain quality of life, and if we demonstrate this around the world, we look at the Human Development Index, I call this a better life, it's the United Nations Human Development Index, it goes from zero to one, and it has elements in it which are more than money. It has elements in it which are level of education, longevity, non-monetary aspects, and you can see that the countries which are darker, which have a higher index, are the ones which you would, would maybe say are the countries which have got, um, you know, the Western countries or more developed countries. Let me try to put this in context with sustainability. I'm going to take each country and plot that on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we're going to have a measure of sustainability, the global hectares. If you have a utilization of more than two global hectares, you are not so sustainable. This is what our NGO friends tell us. So let's have a look at that. On the x-axis, we have got the Human Development Index from 0 0.2 to 1. Each dot is a country, and those countries which are below the red line are within their environmental limits. Because those which are above 0 0.8, I would say, have a better life. And those which are below two global hectares are within their environmental limits. So you tell me how many countries are there. <laughs> and it's perfectly understandable and fair that everybody wants to have a better life, and I think that's highly desirable. 
But if we do it the way the current model is, with our technologies and our consumption of resources, then the world would go up there, and that will not work. It's not working today. What we need is to get down here. And if you are going down that red arrow, it is a very, very different path than if you are going from the left to the right. Because you don't have to build your coal fire power plant to change it afterwards to a wind farm. You can directly build the wind farm. And you can have choices in which you change the life such that you directly go to the green square. And every path for every country will be different. <coughs> every choice will be different. But that choice will be done by us. It will, done, will be done by our governments, by our companies, by our civil society, by us as consumers as voters, as citizens. And as such, I just want to repeat again, let us remember, if we want a sustainable future, it's our responsibility. Thank you. Come join me. Thank you, Hakan. Thank you very much. Thank you. you may take any seat you would like. Free seating, yes. Please, no fighting. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I don't know about you, but I, I'm overwhelmed um, trying to process the information that we've had this evening. Uh, oh, we got everybody. We're, we're full, full uh, yeah, if we're going we're gonna to try to do this, we're going to try to get these people not to have uh, um, aneurysm with information, but we have a lot of wisdom at this at this uh, panel right now. The point is we're trying to process the urgency, the opportunities, and everything that we, uh, we've heard this evening, and um, delighted to have all these experts sitting among us. You met uh, Hakan and uh, Ravi, of course. We have uh, Aisata from Ernst & Young representing the finance and uh, uh, impact finance, socially responsible finance is going to help us. Mark Bischler, ambassador at large, I love that title, um, who is, has a fascinating blend of looking at the policy side as well as uh, the climate finance and human rights. Um, and Denise, you've joined us all the way from Geneva, uh, representing a lot of innovative solutions uh, that you are investing in some of them, one picking up of, of what Ravi was telling us, how technology and innovation is driving some of the solutions. Now, we have a very, very large panel, um, and, uh, and I'm going to try to direct a couple of questions to you that we won't all be able to answer, but please take the one that you feel very, very strongly about. Um, what I would like to begin with asking is, given the urgency, given the data, the statistics that makes us such an obvious critical path issue, the reason we're all sitting here, what is inhibiting us to be addressing it faster and better? We clearly have the capacity and the capability um, to, to, to be managing this, but there's something that's obviously inhibiting the solutions, and I'm very curious if you would like to share, uh, I hear a lot of blame. Uh, it's finance, it's the innovation, it's policy. Um, so perhaps from the three panelists that we have not heard from, Aisata, would you like to begin? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for this great question, uh, Hera. I believe that uh, leadership is missing here. We really need strong leadership in order to um, be vocal about the issue and ensure that we have strong empowerment. And I'm coming from the private equity practice of EY, and uh, as many others, I strongly believe that private equity will take that leadership role from a finance perspective and demonstrate that ESG considerations because they could definitely be embedded into the finance uh, agenda. Um, this is basically based on a couple of facts. First of all, when you look at actually the size of the industry, uh, private equity grew massively uh, since the the middle of the 20th century from a very big asset class. We are talking about three trillions of asset under management as at end of 2017. Secondly, the structure of the business, uh, when you look at private equity, you can see that ESG consideration could be embedded at each single step of the, of the business from deal um, screening to due diligence and uh, negotiation to uh, oversight of portfolio companies and value capture at the, at the moment of, of the exit. 
And last but not least, the holding period is extremely important. Most of the time, GPs will keep um, portfolio companies for an average of five years roughly versus a couple of months for stocks of public companies. And within five years, you can achieve much more from an ESG perspective versus a couple of months when you talk about uh, stocks. And uh, because of this, uh, I strongly believe that PEs uh, is one of the vector and has a great card to play when it comes to being a leader and showing that uh, ESG could again be uh, on the top of the finance agenda. Excellent. So the possibility of, of leveraging private equity. I see Mark already going for the microphone. I'd love to hear your perspective. Do you, do you agree? Um, uh, in part. In part. <laughs> <If I may. laughs> A so diplomatic yes, response. No, uh, leadership, yes, of course, is very important. Um, I would, however, like to point to the fact that political leadership has come to a level that is unprecedented back in 2015 when uh, the international community at the highest possible level of uh, heads of state and government adopted uh, Agenda 2030 and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. They also adopted uh, the Addis Abeba Action Agenda on Financing Sustainable Development. And they adopted uh, later in that year, in December, the COP21, the International Agreement uh, Against uh, Climate Change with all the commitments that they took in that regard. Never before had we seen such an homogeneous uh, agreement at the highest political level throughout the international community. So leadership might still be necessary, of course, also, uh, not only in the public spheres, but also in the, in the private sphere, that's for sure. Then uh, an another, another um, aspect that we want uh, to take into account when we speak about why we take so long. Well, uh, sustainable development and development in general takes very long. It has taken Luxembourg 130 to 150 years to go from zero to 100 or to 120. Uh, so uh, if you think about uh, developing countries that have only been independent since 60 years, let's be a little bit patient, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Denise, would you like to share your thoughts? Um, my point of view is um, the co creating a global community to really um, uh, working on the uh, very interesting projects. So we need to create this coalition. We need to create this communication, not only within the, the land, within the countries, but between the countries globally. This is the only way I believe we will put the mindset in everybody's mind. Uh, we will reprogram in the mind to come together and to work together to give now something back to the nature and to start living together with the nature and save the planet. So this is, this is what I believe. This mindset is not yet there. And this is what I believe we should be working on all together with the project owners, with the finance teams, with the governments, with the individuals, with the investors. If I echo what I've heard from the panel so far, leadership, patience from Mark, and collaboration. These are terms I think that resonate with everybody. And um, Ravi, uh, perhaps this goes back to your concept of a coalition. We All these concepts that we've heard from Aisata on how finance is mobilizing uh, and uh, and perhaps even this this, uh, this movement. Do, do, can we be patient for to create this coalition, or do we need urgent focus? I think I, I got the urgent focus. H how do we how do we put this together? How do we put the pieces from the other panelists together in a in a more action plan for for us? I think I'd like to respond to that by first explaining why I think we aren't focusing on this. Yeah, Please. because that was the first question, right? That was the first question. Why aren't we focusing on this? So if we look at political leadership leaders, we know that they have a window of sometimes four years, sometimes eight years. I'm not talking of this as a global issue. And most decisions that are made when they are in political leadership is to do with issues to do with those eight years. Most business leaders would be looking at delivering the next quarter's results the next quarter's results. And if a business leader is focused on the next quarter's results, 
And a political leader is looking at probably doing things which are going to strengthen their political stability for the future. My question then is, who is doing something for the planet in terms of sustainability? Because if you are looking at a short-term quarterly performance, there's no way you're going to do strategic decision-making. If you're looking at a window of four years, again, you're not going to look at a strategic decision. Because sustainability as a concept is a medium to long-term concept. It is not a short-term concept. So if that is the issue, it's, I, I, I'd like to give you this, diagram, this image. Think of a CEO sitting on a treadmill. And the treadmill gradient is increasing, and the speed of the treadmill is also moving much faster. As the treadmill goes faster and faster, and the issues become more and more, and there's so much of firefighting to do, you start beginning to hold on to those rails and start looking down. Because you don't want to fall off the, the, the treadmill. And I think that is why we are not having solutions. Because most of us are being rewarded for short-termism, short-term results. And the day our reward system says, we will reward you for taking strategic, sustainable decisions, that's the day things are going to change. But as long as we have short-term rewards, we will never be able to address the strategic problems. That's why Casper was, what, 12 years old when, in 1992, and today, 26 years old, and what is happening to the planet? We are much worse off than in 1992. Much worse off. So all the COP meetings that we've held, I think now nearly 21 or 22 or 24, they've not been able to manage the very things that they were committing to manage. So I think one good thing that has happened is more people are aware about it, but is there urgency? Ravi, I love your provocative responses, and I'm going to turn back to Mark in a moment, but I'm using moderator privilege to walk into the audience because I would love to hear if Ravi's model of the CEO on a treadmill, would you respond to Ravi's comments, sir? <laughs> For sure. Um, well, I, I think, first of all, the, the conviction of, the, of, uh, of CEOs in general is very important <laughs> today in, uh, in business. So one thing which is uh, more and more visible is that sustainabil sustainability can be a profitable business. And that's a way of reconciling probably short-term issues or short-term focus and, and long-term uh, long strategies. And, um, well, for our bank, that's uh, a conviction. And uh, I think we mentioned figures about uh, profitable substitution of uh, businesses uh, accompanying tr energy transition. And that's exactly what we try to do. And I like the idea also of coalition because we, not, we cannot do that alone. And it's not anymore a, a B2C or B2B2C a business. It's a global B to global B business uh, for, for the future. So for me, I think there is some hope. But uh, so we try. And maybe to finish on my, my remarks, um, there was a conference in, in Paris uh, three weeks ago with our group inviting a lot of corporates and investors and there was um, a statement to say well we are meeting again one year later and we are still the same in the room so there is a problem we are not enough to be convinced that we do, do more with more more and more people so the question is not really only leadership is how do we gather much more people in the room or in the field to, to, uh, to fight together. So uh, not so sure it's a question of short term, it's more to be uh, massively uh, connected uh, for, for, for these uh, new businesses. Huh? Thank you very much. I'm yeah. remarkably impressed with actually diversity in this room. Uh, here alone I, I realize how 
how many people from different uh, walks of life, and uh, we've checked your, your uh, corporate profiles and, and vice versa, and, or, or your, your backgrounds, and we know that people are here collaborating from their own perspectives, are here to learn. Um, Public-private partnerships is critical. We, this collaboration in the private sector, and you, you, you pointed a finger to the business leaders, and you went a little elbow over to the government players. So perhaps, Mark, uh, you want to take that? Oh, you have your own microphone. Please share your responses to Ravi, the role of the... Yes. No, I, I definitely agree with Ravi that, uh, that progress is not, uh, is not uh, fast enough. On the other hand, we, are, uh, we have to deal with very, very big constraints yeah. also. Uh, with regard to the, to the results that came out of this international exercise and the different COPs and uh, the framework convention against climate change and so on and so forth at the UN level, uh, not everything is really black. Of course, it has been too slow, but, but since 2009, for example, uh, fossil fuel subsidies have come down by 30%. They are still much too high, I agree, <laughs> but they have come down 30%. Uh, then uh, the rate by which people have been able to be alleviated out of poverty has never been so high as in the, in the 2000s now. Never before. Before the Sustainable Development Goals, we had the Millennium Development Goals. And then when I speak to the point that, that, uh, that uh, Geoffrey uh, Bazin just made on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the need to work together in public-private partnerships, Never before uh, the COP21 has the implication by the private sector been so active and so intense. So that's very positive, uh, uh, a very positive outcome of the COP21 that is not so uh, well publicized. But uh, we can tell also from what we did after COP21 in climate finance that the private sector is increasingly implicated in this effort. And after all, responsible investment is the fastest growing segment of the overall global investment universe. And I'm gonna take a little, take, take that point and pick up what I said that was talking about before about private equity mo mobilizing into the space and maybe look at, um, Ravi, you gave us some examples of innovations that are happening. I um, mean, if we're gonna get people excited about solutions and if we're gonna get private capital and public-private partnerships moving in this direction, we need to find investment-ready projects, projects that we can um, understand that they will have the return on investment that might be social and or environmental along a side of being economically feasible. Uh, Denise, you're, you're looking at the space, innovative technologies. Um, could you pick up maybe on what are some of Ravi's examples, what you see in the space of climate change that will inspire us? Yeah, I'm actually delighted to talk about that because um, I, um, I have the privilege to work with some um, people who has uh, such a good vision for the future and they own these beautiful projects. And some examples are uh, water, food, uh, nature. So um, a technology that is able to create um, or to facilitate the rain to fall through the humidity and technology that water falls and then maintaining that water for the use in the agriculture and forestation. And this, the uh, target uh, regions are obviously the regions where there is drought, there is no rain falling. Um, and what happens is this creates an ecosystem in that region where education is, uh, is the focus then people get jobs and um, you know everything everything just as a as a chain gets better so there is a wealth and security in the in the country so this is something that is very exciting and some other ones um, like uh, mangroves um, sea grass beds um, this is actually this is a, a a vegetation that is protecting the uh, lands from erosion, soil erosion, uh, biodiversity. If we don't uh, keep this vegetation, then we will lose the, our coastal uh, shorelines. And that is going to create another problem for the, for the countries. Um, the wildlife, for example, wildlife reserves in South Africa, and there are beautiful projects where they are going to create these ecosystems globally. Um, they, um, 
what what is exciting about it is not only the idea and how they want to uh, really perform the objectives, is also combining this with uh, with blockchain technology, where. Um, for example, I will give the, uh, the wildlife uh, preservation project. Um, the project has investors coming from impact, so we call impact investors. They can invest in fiat currency and the to um, token or uh, cryptocurrency. And there is a part of the philanthropist, so there is a target of two types of investors for a project. And then we use blockchain technology so that the cash movements in certain countries, mainly the Africa, um, are, um, are managed by a trustful system. Um, so this, is, this actually completes the, the full project on the, on the financial side of things as well. Um, to be honest, like, uh, there are so many innovations, there is so much good, good thoughts and beautiful people who want to do the project. Um, I see, I see hope. I see positivity. I see, um, I see when these groups come together, they want to do something good. There is this energy between them to to move forward. That's an excellent message for yeah. us. Um, and the innovation is exciting. Thinking of blockchain and climate change, it's it's two concepts that I think we have social and technology on two different sides. Um, but let me let me bounce that question back to the investors at the table. We have. Perhaps I saw that from the perspective of private investment, and and then Hakan on the pers pers perspective of institutional investment, are the types of projects that Denise is talking about, blockchain and innovations and mangroves, are these attractive investments for your organizations to be mobilizing capital to? And if 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 not, what? How do we get the capital to the innovation that solves a problem set that we've been introduced to tonight? Uh, would you like to begin, Hakan? Thanks for the question, Hedda. No management without measurement. You have to know what the outcome is when you put your money in. And that outcome is not that evident. You don't see it in the financial statements. You don't see it in a credit rating. You really have to do the work yourself. You have to understand what's at the end of it. And that is a long process. In the case of the European Investment Bank, we're a strange animal. We have the effort and the mission to do that. We have the experts, sector experts, who go in and dig into it and do their due diligence, their environmental due diligence, their social due diligence, and look at the outcome and what that investment is going to do. And on top of it, we're long term. So that's a big benefit. But what about a retail investor? If you want to know what your money is doing, how do you find out? How do you know what the effect of that investment is going to be on, say, climate, because we talked about it, let alone biodiversity or other issues? So we are having a fantastic set of financial statements and audits, and it's really well developed. On the other side, on the environmental and social side, we are more at the beginning. Maybe on the environmental side, even more developed than on the social side. So once you know what the money is doing, then you can take the decisions. And maybe some people will take it happily, and they want to do it, but they don't know. So it's really that gap we have to close, and we have to close as a mainstream, not as impact investors only or multinationals, but really in the mainstream. And I think that will make a huge difference. I said that as we're, we're coming to a bit of a close for the panel discussions, and I'd like some final comments to everybody. Please feel free to pick up on the thread that we just discussed, but also add a comment for us uh, regarding the role of us as individuals or as a country. Um, if you can give us a call to action, because I'd like to hear from all the panelists what we should take from this, this conference, from your perspective. And I know that Raymond will, will certainly put his foot down as well. But uh, if you'd like to share some reflections and last comments. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to quickly comment uh, on your point. I, can, I think we are seeing a very strong appetite for integrated reporting. Uh, a lot of stakeholders have a very strong appetite for that. A lot of companies as well as slowly but surely moving toward having integrated reporting, not only financial disclosures in the financial statement, but a full bunch of information demonstrating that they are definitely taking into consideration ESG aspect into their finance agenda. And those are going hands on hands. I mean, they are less and less working on silos. They really want to show that they are making an impact and they are conscious about the challenges uh, that have been clearly described by, uh, 
by Ravi a couple of minutes ago. So things are moving, probably slowly, but certainly surely, uh, I'll say. And as a closing remark, I believe that we are stakeholders of all the businesses that are like um, filling our lives. And as stakeholders, we have uh, our word to say and we have our role to play as well within that debate. Do we, are we responsible consumers? Are we asking ourselves every single day, did I consume responsibly? Did I, I have been vocal about the issue. I am raising my kids for those who have kids in a social responsible manner. So those are questions that should reflect actually uh, our commitment toward uh, having the ball rolling. Excellent. Mark, could you talk perhaps about the role of Luxembourg? Do you, do you yeah. subscribe to what Ravi said our role could be as a shining light of uh, change? Well, I definitely hope so. That what we were aiming for when we uh, were coming together as a climate finance uh, task force, preparing also the road to the financial uh, uh, sustainable financial roadmap that the uh, government adopted. And uh, I could not in, uh, insist enough on the on the necessity, but then also on the usefulness of, of putting public and private efforts together, pulling in one direction, each and every one for their own uh, for their own motivation. An NGO will come on board because they are mission driven. A business leader or a bank will come on board because they pursue a uh, business plan. And a politician will come on board to implement some public policy. It doesn't matter where they come from as long as they pull in the same direction. And then maybe a final word on uh, I'm, I'm way too old to be a, spokes, a spokesman for the millennials or the Generation Z, but I'm very sympathetic to the level of, of uh, sens sensitivity that they bring to these issues of sustainability, much more than my generation did before. And uh, to the politicians, I would say, this generation is uh, the generation of the future, of future voters, and to the business people, I would say, this is the generation of the future clients and investors. Message for everybody. Thank you. And Ravi, I think these points are really echoing a lot of what you said. So I'm going to give you the final word and I'm going to go to Denise now. Please, your closing comments. A message for the audience. What would you like us to take away from all the innovation that you're looking at? What would you like to see from these, this audience here in Luxembourg? I would like to see, um, I will go back to the coalition again. Uh, communication. Uh, I think we, we should um, actively come together, all the world. We used a lot the nature. We, we, we need to now live with the nature, be, be a part of it, and to reprogram the mind, as I mentioned before, so that individually everybody can think of uh, contributing to the world and putting the governments, these projects, all, the, all these innovative projects, the funding possibilities, um, investors, individuals, millennials, to come and uh, to work on a large scale to make these projects uh, succeed and to perform. Then we will see the result. Because I see a lot of action on the project side. And to be able to see the results, we need to put all the pieces together globally, not individually. Um, no debate, we just have an objective to save the planet. I think there are projects out there, we should just work together. Wonderful. Hakan. Well, our choice, we as professionals, we as private citizens, it's our choices that make the difference. And I think that's where we have to take our responsibility. And it is only if everyone pulls in the same direction. Uh, and that's very clear. But everyone includes you, you, and me. Very concise. Ravi, now you get to put it all together into the coalition model. Repeat to us what it is that you want us to do. <coughs> OK, so I'm going to start with a very simple image. Imagine the whole planet was on a spaceship and that carried 7.3 billion people. Let's imagine it was a big, unbelievably big Airbus 560 or 1000. The European Union today is probably flying first class on that flight, 800,000 of them, because you guys, the Europe Europeans, have set the pace and the benchmark for excellence in sustainability, I would say even way beyond the UN uh, system because I, I, I have seen
how far ahead the European Union is in sustainability. So you are in the first class seat. Then you have a few countries, Scandinavian countries, European countries. Uh, I mean, they're all there. Now you've got a few countries in Asia, like Bhutan, like Nepal, who are already uh, negative in terms of uh, carbon emissions, right? So they are probably in the business class. And everybody else is in the economic class. But when the impacts of climate change come and hit us, whether you're in the first class seat, or whether you're in the business class seat, or whether you're in the economy seat, the plane is going to crash, and everyone is going to get destroyed. And no one's going to say, he died in first class. He died in business class. He died in the economic class because none of us are going to be able to survive a 1.5 plus 2 degrees, 4 degrees centigrade planet. I don't think anybody could get away with talking about a crash and, and getting people laughing other than Ravi. It was fantastic. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, can we please thank our speakers and panelists uh, for sharing their views. They're going to be with us afterwards for the drink and a chance for you to interact more, more closely uh, with them. And depending on uh, your areas of interest, it could be that you want to speak to the, to the different people. And thank you again from all of us. Really wonderful to have you all here. You guys want to stay there and watch Raymond from behind or from the front? Because he's pretty... The front. Okay, he's more interesting from the front. That was funny, too. Um, without further ado, uh, we started 15 minutes late, and we are uh, wrapping up uh, around the same delay. Uh, apologies for that. I hope it was worth your while. Um, we now have the chairman of Investing for Development, who is part of the snowball I mentioned from the beginning. It's how Raymond and Ravi met and started discussing this that brought us all here together. And what we love about Raymond is that he speaks from the heart. Um, it can also be provocative and, uh, and very energizing. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say, Raymond. So will you join us on stage? Now, a, a lot has been said, okay? So I will not repeat everything which has been said, but I hope we have been able to convince all of you that, uh, now for those of you who know me a little bit better, that it is five minutes to midnight or benefits we live, okay, on this issue. Uh, we hope we have been uh, able to sensibilize you that you have seen only optimists today, okay? We hope that you go out of this room as an optimist too, okay? And that you think about what you can do to help this, because as it always came back, it's coalition, coalition, coalition. We all sit on the same plane. We all sit on the same spaceship, okay? And uh, perhaps I wanted to um, share with you a quote which is in my mind since at least 10 years, okay? Which is, if ever you wondered why somebody has not fixed the issue, okay, I hope that you realize today that you are this somebody, okay? We all are this somebody, okay? And that is why we have committed to make all of you, okay, if possible, part of this snowball, okay? So that we continue rolling, that we go out of this room as optimists, as not as pessimists, that we go out of this room and we say, what can each of us do? Uh, and for example, uh, a question which I always asked uh, the bankers, okay, where I'm saying, why don't you do more? Okay, so those of you who know me, I'm always looking for more, okay? And the answer I very often get, okay, is, um, you know, our clients don't ask really for impact finance, okay, products, okay? because you see our clients are not so sensibilized about this. And yes, if you analyze it, and some of them have done it, if they analyze it, the major issue is that the average age in this room is relatively low, 
Okay? So the, 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 age, the problem is that those who are sensible, more sensibilized to this issue okay, is many of the younger generations, okay? but unfortunately, okay, it's the older generations who still have the money. Okay? So that's why, for example, one of my friends approached me last week and he said, listen, you know, I have four kids. Okay? Since three years, I'm offering for Christmas to each of my kids okay, a share in an impact finance structure. I want them to get the reports. I want them to sensibilize. I want them to be proud of it. Okay? And perhaps this is an idea each of us can take home. Okay? There are many offers on the, on the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. With this, I will close this and thank again all the speakers, thank again all of you, and especially thank BGLB and P. Paribas, who is also offering the cocktail, where I'm sure we will be able to change, exchange many, many wild ideas. Thank you very much. <laughs>